Right, good morning and, and welcome to uh, this uh, summer lecture. Um, a free one with um, none of the COVID worries or anything else. Um, you'll be aware that there are three lectures today and then there are three activities this afternoon. This afternoon's activities are a, uh, a little bit violent, I guess. <laughs> Um, I'm sure no one will get harmed from them, but they're, as I understand it, archery, shotguns, and pistols. So uh, should be good fun. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The, there are no fire alarm drills going on today, so if the fire alarm does go off, um, your main fire exit is behind you, just there. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, if, we do, if we do find ourselves in that situation, then you need to gather the, the far side of the trees out there. Um, I, I have apologies from our President Tony, uh, Vice President Reen, and Chair of um, Conference, Costas, who none of them could make it today. Reen, of course, is um, going through uh, cancer treatment at the moment, so... I think we'll forgive him at least. Um, particularly, um, we need to thank the organisers of today. Uh, we need to thank Melissa because she puts a huge amount of effort into these in ensuring that, that, pe that people turn up, that what we provide is interesting and worthwhile. Uh, we also need to thank the um, conference committee because, again, um, there is a lot of detail that goes into it. And we need to thank the administration, Beverly and her team. So I'm sure you will um, share those thoughts with them as you see them later on. So I'm going to pass you over now to um, James, who will look after us for the um, conference and defend us from the uh, weapons this afternoon. So, James. Thank you, Dave. Um, so yeah, just, uh, I'll be looking after you all today, at least for the morning bit, keeping our speakers on check. Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly run through the agenda. So format's gonna be a couple of lectures lined up for this morning with a break in between. Um, each of the lectures will be around 50 minutes. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of each. Um, because we are recording this, we'll just ask if you have got a question, wait for us to get you a microphone, just so we can capture all the audio properly, but we'll be running around with microphones kind of after. Um, as we invite the speakers up, I'll introduce the, the kind of session and the speaker a little bit more, so I won't do them all at this point. Um, and then obviously into the afternoon, post-lunch, um, we will start the fun stuff. Um, and you'll we'll kind of have a bit of a roster for you to follow for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I actually wanted to open up with a, a bit of an intro, a bit of an update from an SCT point of view. Um, been working hard around the kind of training piece this year. We, we dropped some snippets at the last kind of lecture. Um, but ultimately, we had a bit of a rethink at the end of last year on, on how we really support our members and how we really drive our mission statement, which is to kind of in, improve the standards, increase the standards across the telecoms industry. Um, so last time we'd done this kind of update, it was what we're trying to do. We're now in a position, we've done some stuff. Um, and I wanted to just give you a quick update on that, just so you, you're kind of aware, by all means, you can leverage that. Um, and the ask is, tell everyone you know, you know, any other SCT members you've got, we're now live with this, and we'd love you to take, you know, make the most of that opportunity. So um, we've done a bit of a transition. We kind of looked at the end of last year, and we look at where our industry's going, the move to fibre, the move to automation, the move to AI, all of this stuff. It's going to change how we do this stuff. Um, we've always had an, an offering around our technical training stuff, um, and you know, ultimately we need to now start focusing on what we support in the future. Um, and rather than to continue to, to kind of so the existing courses, we thought it'd be a great initiative and, and drive some extra value for you as our members to kind of open those up. We're not seeing these technologies turn off overnight. We know we're nowhere near half of this, especially when it comes to cable. Um, so what we wanted to do was kind of open up our technical training library and, and make that free to you all. It's now life. Um, you probably would have seen the emails come out, your usernames and passwords and stuff to get on. If you do have any issues, by all means, catch me or Philip sat right in the back corner there. He's the guru behind all of the technical training stuff. Um, but any questions on that, um, by all means, just reach out to one of us today. 
Um, and likewise, if you feel that would benefit any of your colleagues, peers, um, we no longer now no longer sell these courses, it's a member benefit. So if you're part of the SCTE, you get free access to our entire catalogue. Um, but we didn't want to stop there. We also recognise as technology changes, it's not just all about the tech stuff we learn and develop. The whole human side of things is quite important too. So if you look at how progression through our careers, it's not always about how much technical knowledge you gain, sometimes it's the softer skills, the human skills that you develop too. Nice segue into our first speaker, but the SET have now started to partner with Borderless Performance for us to kind of robust, keep knocking that, I'll try not to, um, for us to start to offer out a little bit more in the human skills space. So covering topics like imposter syndrome, CV writing and interview prep, um, dealing with change, making the most of the 30, first, no, first, first 90 days in a new role. Um, we know these are all kind of key topics for us to cover, especially when it comes to development within careers. Um, so we've launched those, we've run the first couple of sessions, had some really great feedback so far. We've got a whole roster plan for kind of September onwards because we all need a break through July and August. Um, but by all means, we'll obviously share some links out post, but have a look through. They're all bite-sized, they're all virtual in nature. So, you know, go and join up for the ones that you're interested in. The final bit, and especially when you look across our industry, one of the key relationships that anyone can form when it comes to development is that whole mentor and mentee relationship. We know a lot of the development we do is hands-on, whether it's with a more experienced engineer or a manager figure or a leader figure. So we also know the importance of a mentor kind of relationship and how an effective one of those can really support. As such, we also wanted to do something in this place um, to really help drive the, you know, the, the capability and the confidence of our mentors within the industry. And once again, with borderless performance, we're now starting to launch or we're, we're in the plan of launching a full mentor development program. Um, we'll share some more details post again, um, but obviously if you're interested, we're going to capture some stuff around the taster session, um, not just for someone that wants to go into a formal mentor. These are great skills for any leader, any manager, anyone that has a team. Um, so we'll share some more details, but just wanted to kind of plug that at the start of this. Um, it's quite nice. We wanted to kind of remove the barriers, and it's now a proposition for our members. So use as much or as little, not as little, as much as you can. Um, get the value from it, but that's fine. Um, Cool, that's me done for speaking. Um, I'm just gonna go through a quick um, introduction for our first speaker, um, brief the session, and I'll let you kind of take the mic, and the floor is yours. So first up, we have Sarah Gully, who's the founder and director of Borderless Performance. Um, she's here to talk to us through breezing through change. Um, quick bye for Sarah. So Sarah, the founder of Borderless Performance, is passionate about providing executive coaching, mentoring and leadership training solutions to individuals as well as corporate clients. Sarah guides her coaching and mentoring clients to identify the goals and works to enable them to identify the necess necessary steps to achieve them. Prior to starting the company in 2021, Sarah gained extensive leadership experience as vice, pres as vice president in the IT and telecoms industry. She has specialised in leading transformation and change delivery teams across the UK and Europe, most recently during her time with Virgin Media and Liberty Global. Coaching and Mentor is the perfect marriage of Sarah's vast leadership and project delivery experience, as well as her love and passion for developing people. Um, I really like this quote at the end because I use the same language quite a lot at the time, so um, happily say to say, qualifications, accreditation and experience are all important but it's the softer or human skills that are the secret source to a successful technical career. With that, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm really uh, happy to be here. It's nice to see some uh, friendly and faces that I know. I'm local, um, used to work at Virgin just down the road when it was down the road. Um, and uh, yeah, have been here many times, so it's really nice to be back at Tilney. I have got some, uh, some cards, um, mainly because when I speak, I know I forget to breathe, I forget to smile, and what else do I forget? And I forget to uh, go slowly. So on each card, it says either breathe, smile, or go slowly. So um, that's hopefully going to help me through this. Um, but also, you know, hopefully my uh, being on first will mean that my nerves and my adrenaline won't get the better of me. So I'm here, um, I'm going to talk about um, how emotional intelligence can be developed, or you can develop your emotional intelligence, and how it can help you in changing circumstances. I mean, we're all in the telecoms tech industry. 
things that I was talking to Philip earlier, um, which is over a cup of coffee this morning, about how things have changed during his career. Um, they're changing every, every day, every year. It's, it's something we're all really used to, that merry-go-round of mergers, acquisitions, reorganisations, you know, and that's just the big stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world as well, which is changing. Um, this session will be a little bit interactive, so feel free to shout out, raise your hand when I ask you. So a bit of participation is great. Um, but we are gonna get, you're going to come away... Um, with three distinct actions, hopefully, for yourself, with how you can develop your own emotional intelligence so you can breeze through change. Was there a clicker? Did I miss? So I've already been introduced by, by James. I don't feel like I need to uh, introduce myself again. Um, one thing that I always forget to mention is I, I'm also the um, mentoring co-chair for WICT, um, the Women in Cable Telecommunications. So um, what we're going to talk about today is um, what is... There's a little bit around what is emotional intelligence. Um, think about how your performance could be impacted by your emotions, um, understand your strengths and gaps, how you can develop your EQ, the, the three main uh, emotional intelligence competencies that will help you to breeze through change are adaptability, empathy and optimism. And then, as I said, um, there'll be three actions that you can take away that are specific to you. So if we can have a think about what are some of the different types of change. Um, what sort of ch I've already mentioned a few of them, so we can gloss over that. So, you know, there's, there's things like, you know, redundancies, mergers, acquisitions, new boss, there's many changes. Um, and some emotions that people might experience when you're experiencing change. You might be a bit fearful, you might be a bit worried, you might be angry, you might be upset, you might be really happy. You know, they're not all negative emotions, but... Usually when it's changed, people are a little bit worried. Just to give you a bit of background, emotional intelligence um, was first developed in the 90s by Daniel Goldman. Um, he was the one that um, it first came up with it, and there's been a, a number of different writers um, and uh, psychologists that have looked into it since. Emotional intelligence is about how your rational and your emotional elements of your brain interact. So the stronger that connection between the rational and the emotional, the faster, the better, the quicker your emotional intelligence is. And it's about our ability to understand and reflect on our emotions that help us go through and deal with change. Now I'm not a scientist, I'm sure probably most of you are, so I'm a little bit daunted but hopefully you're not biologists. Um, but the, the limbic system is, if you know, is where our, it, that controls our emotions. That's, where our, that's the emotional part of our brain. So we will find that um, any information that, we, that comes into our brain through our five senses, you know, our, what we hear, what we see, what we taste, what we smell and what we feel, goes through our brain stem. It then goes through our limbic system. This is very simplistic, obviously goes through our limbic system, and then it goes to our decision-making elements of our brain. So that limbic system is actually an emotional filter. So have you ever seen red mist? You know, people talk about red mist. Obviously, it's not real, but there's some nods in the audience. Hands up. OK, quite a few. Um, and have you ever had maybe some performance feedback, not necessarily from your boss, maybe from somebody in the team, that was a bit insensitive? Got your back up. Yeah. Have you ever um, maybe been aware of somebody in the room, it might be your boss or it might be anybody, somebody in the room when, when we all used to work in offices, maybe we do now, again. Somebody was in a bad mood. Something had gone wrong. Yeah. It, and it just permeates the department um, and, uh, and, I've been, and I've been there, and that used, to be, that used to be me at one point. 
Um, I remember standing, you know, I had a stand-up desk. I'd stand up and I'd, you know, shout and <laughs> shout a lot. Um, and, uh, and then somebody from HR came to me and said, did you realise that actually your mood, good or bad, permeates the whole department? And I was like, no, I didn't really think, I really didn't think about it. So I then sort of started to temper my mood a bit or not make it so outward facing. That is being in control of your emotions and that is being in control of your emotional intelligence, how you are impacting other people. There's a guy called Elliot. Um, it's, a, it's a case study that's used in many emotional intelligence um, theses and talks. Um, uh, when I did my emotional intelligence training, um, it was uh, at, at, the, at the crux of, you know, this is why emotional intelligence, um, this is where it first really came from. Elliot was a model citizen. He was a great father, a great husband. He was great at his job. As I was driving over here this morning, I was thinking, actually, he sounds like a bit of an idiot. <laughs> you know, he, he was one of those people who's, he was br apparently brilliant at everything. There must have been something he wasn't good at, maybe chess or something, I don't know. Um, but he then had a tumour, which uh, they took out from his brain. Um, and everyone thought the operation had been successful. He was fine. He was you know, walking, talking. He was back at work. He was back in the family. You know, everything, everyone was really relieved. However, things started to unravel for Elliot. Um, unravel so much that he, he found it really difficult to make decisions, but it, and, and he wasn't interacting, sorry, I've done it as well, interacting with people as, as well as he had done previously. Um, he lost his job. He got divorced. You know, everything he tried to do, his friends started to drift away. Someone. He, he ended up uh, in the office of a neuroscientist um, who wanted to look at what was, what was going on. Um, and he found out that every t everything he asked, every conversation he had with Elliot was th there were no emotions. He was not upset by anything. He was not elated by anything. Um, so this uh, doctor spoke to some of Elliot's friends and found that actually this was the change in him. And they had a look and they realised that actually he had lost that bit of his brain that processed his emotions, that processed how he dealt with things. And it was that, and then that sort of led to a major study, it's not all just related to one person, a major study um, around emotional intelligence as well. And that was where it was found that actually before then, it was thought that emotions were just irrational, you know, outbursts. But then it, then it was realised that emotions were actually really, really important in how we make decisions. Now, what I don't know is what happened to Elliot. <laughs> Because he'd lost this bit of his brain, so I don't know that, how that actually, you know, helped him or not. Um, or then he just became, you know, the subject of a book and a study. Um, but I, I like to think that, you know, he then developed his emotional intelligence competencies, or at least people understood him a bit better. So there are actually ten emotional, it's called EQ, emotional intelligence competencies. Um, they are, uh, well, I'm not going to go through them all because we're only focusing on three of them really today. But there are some four which are called the inner focus. That's about yourself. Um, so that's your self-knowing, how well you know yourself. Your self-control, which was the example of me in the office. Um, your self-confidence and your self-reliance. How reliant are you on, on making your own decisions? The next set, the next three, are called other focuses. I don't like that phrase really at all. Um, other. Um, and that's about how um, you understand the business in, uh, situation and how it impacts other people. So that's about your empathy, your relationship skills, and your straightforwardness. So giving, f giving feedback in that example that I spoke about earlier would be being straightforward, you know, not beating around the bush, but having empathy, thinking about it from the other person's point of view, um, and also maintaining that relationship. 
So that's your other focus. And then the other one is an outer focus. So whereas the inner focus is all about yourself, the outer focus is about other people and how you are externally. That's your optimism, self actualization and your adaptability. So what we're going to talk about what we're going to talk about is, in times of change, it's your adaptability, which is the ability to adapt your thoughts and feelings and respond in, in changing circumstances. Your optimism, see the possi possibilities past your immediate horizon and to develop that resilience in the face of setbacks and your empathy, which is understanding the thoughts and feelings of others so that you can communicate maybe a change with other people or with you know, how things are changing for you with your teammates or with your team or with your management with the rest of the organisation in a, in a caring and authentic way. So does anyone know who this is? Okay, good. So this is uh, the Oracle from the Matrix. Don't worry about, I'll say vase. She says vase, but you know, tomato, tomato. Um, so she's talking about, I mean, there's a whole number of things that she's talking about, and there's probably, you know, a whole websites and conversations online that I could look at that are about all the things that she means by this. Don't worry about the vase. But from an adaptability point of view, it's about capacity to react well to change and adjust your emotions, thoughts. So the vase is going to, is going to smash. Whether you knock it over today, tomorrow, it was always meant to be. Um, but you can't change everything, but you need to adapt. So just don't worry about that one. So... What else, what was she, in terms of adaptability, what do you think she might have been telling Neo? One person, anybody want to shout out one thing? Pardon? What will be, will be. Yeah, what will be, will be. So don't sweat the small stuff. Don't overthink things. Be open to change. So... I said that we were going to come away, or you were going to come away with three things. So we're going to have one action for, yours, for each of you, if you want to take it, um, to build adaptability, empathy, and optimism. So adaptability is about being flexible, being open-minded, and accepting that life is that constant process of change. It's going to change whether you struggle against it or not. Neo was struggling against being the one. He didn't think he was the one. He was also overthinking it. So, you know, don't overthink it. Just be accepting and be accepting of new horizons. Do you have fixed set ideas? Is there something you need to be more receptive to? Are you resistant to change? Those are the sort of questions that you can ask yourself when you're thinking about flexibility. Open-mindedness. Do you need to expand your comfort zone? Would it help to take a little bit of risk every day? Would it help to listen to others' perspective? Properly listen. Be curious about why they think that. That's your open-mindedness. Do you need to let go of perfection? Do you need to think that actually nobody has, or there is no one correct answer? Have a think about some of those questions. Have a think about what's the one thing you can personally do to increase your, or improve your adaptability. Has anybody got anything you don't have to say? Well, it would be nice. I mean, just summarising what you say, it sounds like you're saying the ability to change and be adaptable is like a muscle, isn't it? 
It is. So the more we exercise that muscle by small adaptabilities in our daily life, by maybe just changing it up slightly here and there, our muscle is in better shape to perform. Yes. That's absolutely right. So if, in case you didn't hear that, that's, it's, it's like a muscle that you can exercise and get stronger and get better and develop. Um, and emotional intelligence is very much like that. It's, it's, it's part of your brain. Um, so you can, you've got a technical muscle, but you also have a, an, an IQ, and, but you also have an emotional muscle that you can exercise and get better. Small steps, always a really good idea. For my clients that I coach, quite often I, I advise, start if it's something new to you, start with your friends and family. They're much more forgiving. Maybe even the, you know, if you've got children, children are a great place to start. You know, if you if you're, want to practice open-mindedness, talk to a child and ask them why and why they're doing something a certain way and why they won't mind all this. They will love the stupid questions. You know, it's a great place to practice. So you're right. that uh, working from home is making a difference to people in that I'm, I'm a single person, I work from home, I don't have children around me and I don't work in a team office with people. Do you think we're losing some of these skills by the fact that we're becoming very focused in our own little world with no challenges? Yeah. We don't have anybody around us to please, we don't have anybody around us that we're upsetting, so we're just becoming in, in our own little world in lots of ways. Is it making a big difference working from home? It is, it is, it absolutely is. And you say there's no one we're upsetting, there, there probably is, but you just don't know it as much. If you're, in an, oops, sorry, if you're in an office environment and you upset someone, you can sense it even when they've left the room. Uh, they, you, know, you might get some evils. They might not make you a coffee. You know, whatever it is. Or they might come back and say, I didn't like what you said then. I didn't agree with you. Whereas when it's, everything is meeting-based... It's very difficult. It's very difficult to build those relationships. I was talking to Melissa uh, as well when I came in this morning, first time we've met face to face, and um, and she was telling me about how uh, she started her job. Hope you don't mind me showing. Started her current job in lockdown. It's a very difficult place to make and build those relationships for people to and to build that that trust um, that comes with. Um, with leadership or management or just being part of a team um, and, and that emotional connection. And, and especially if you live on your own, um, I'm the sort of person that I really love to be with people um, and I have to seek it out. And if there's some people I need to meet and they're local, I'll go coffee, you know, a real coffee, not just a virtual coffee if we can, you know. Um, but it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, so out of all those 10 emotional intelligence competencies, one of them was relationship skills. Um, one of them was empathy. It's really hard to read people when you're on a little screen. Um, you, you have, there's so much you don't see, and it's so much more important to, to show. I mean, body language, you, you just see the hands. You don't, even James and I were talking last week, you don't even see how tall people are, you know. Both very tall, and people, that's usually the first thing that, pe uh, that people come back to me with. I didn't realise you were so tall. Um, so yeah, and if you rely on your, I, 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 through my career, I've relied a lot on my personality. Um, you can't really do that when you're on a square screen and everything is a meeting to talk about something. So it's a very different world. And um, I'm talking at, I've got, I'm running a panel at Connected Britain in September, around just that, just that sort of stuff. So thank you for, for the question. So hopefully you've all, that's given you all time to think about what you're going to do in terms of adaptability. So we're going to move on to empathy. This is Susan Sarandon. I'm not sure why she was talking about empathy, but she's actually, you know, there are millions of quotes on empathy. It's just one I took. When you start to develop your powers of empathy, the whole world opens up. And when I read that, I was just like, that is so true. That is absolutely so true, because when, you're, when, you, when you develop your empathy, you start to ask more questions, you start to be more curious of people, you start to think about things from other people's perspective, and actually that whole world does open up from your perspective to everybody's perspective. So 
showing you care, listening and being curious, having an emotional connection. These are the, th these are the elements of building empathy. Early on my, in my career, I had low empathy. I did an emotional intelligence assessment in 2012. It wasn't really low. But it was lower than all my other competencies. Um, and I talked it through with the coach, and we, we realised that, or I realised, that I'd always been told as a child not to ask questions, not to be rude. So even as an adult, I'm thinking, well, you know, if somebody says, I'm going for an operation, I won't be around for a week, just leave it. You know, don't ask. But actually now I go, well, they can say, don't you? Yeah. Now I just say, I don't mean to be rude, but are you okay? You know? Then they can talk to me if they want or not. Um, if I don't know, maybe that's is just because I'm older. If I don't know the, a technical issue, I don't know what, what it is, I'm quite happy to ask. Um, but if it's something emotional, I wasn't really happy to ask. So having a general understanding and finding out more about that person, why they've done something a certain way. Having that curiosity to understand it from their perspective and consider that, considering their thoughts and feelings. So things they're not even saying, they might not even be aware of themselves. And that's the sort of thing you get from body language, um, amongst other things. So there are, there are three steps to improving your empathy. The first one is listening. Sounds like a really obvious one. We can all do that. Um, but actually, there are many stages. I think there are five, sta five stages of listening. I mean, you look online, there's, you can have seven stages, four stages. But um, you can listen and just hear. You can listen um, and ask questions and truly look to understand. And you can listen as well with empathy. So, so demonstrating that genuine interest and understanding and wanting to know the context of the person's, what they're saying. Curiosity, so reflecting what they've said, you know, what I've heard you say is. And also looking at the, the feelings or, you know, that must have been really hard for you. That, especially in times of change, you know, how are you feeling about that? Not always about what are your thoughts, but how are you feeling about that? And then sensing what the other person's not saying. They might be getting upset, they might be getting angry, they might, there could be any, any other things, but there's, there's so many things that we listen to those cues that aren't just words. So have a think, what's the one thing you can do to increase your empathy? Do you listen enough? Could you listen more? Could you be more curious when somebody else is talking about something from their perspective? Do you, do you pick up on those emotional cues? Do you look for them? Are you curious enough to think about one thing you can do? Because it's adaptability, empathy, and optimism. These are the three things that will really help you build that resilience through change. And your teams and your colleagues. So, optimism. What would Dory do? She would, she would, she would just keep swimming. That is not, uh, you know, that is not optimism. That is Dory. That's what people think of optimism, are just people who are stupidly positive all the time, regardless of what's happening. Um, again, I was driving over. I am a, a, an overly optimistic person. I know it's sometimes quite annoying. Um, but I haven't always been that way. Optimism is about seeing, seeing a different a different way, a different slant. I spoke to the psychologist um, Martin Newman um, last week at a, an event with Roche Martin, the people that, ha that have developed the 10 competencies. Um, and he said people who are high in optimism usually have maybe quite a lot of trauma in their younger life, or some trauma, or some challenges. So I look back and... I've had a lot of trauma, you know, some things you can't just be optimistic about, you know, death, violence, crime, you know, all, I've had it, I've had it, and I'm sure you have all had a certain amount of that as well. People who have had a lot of challenges in their younger life, 
have a lot of optimism because it's a coping strategy. It's a way of coping. It's a, you know, things are really bad. How am I going to get myself out of this this time? You know, and it's not an immediate, you know, you do have to um, go through that, you know, the change curve of understanding and maybe a bit of anger and it might take you a while to get to that. Okay, I'm going to reframe this for myself. Um, it's not blind happiness. That's definitely true. It's about people seeing the big picture. It's about looking for the benefit. What's the lesson here? Focusing on the next task, right? What can I do about it? How can I take a bit of control about what's going on around me when I can't control anything? It's not every situation where you need to be optimistic. Obviously, you know, that fly is really interested in what I'm saying. Um, so then building optimism. It's about a positive mood, changing the narrative, looking for the benefit. Not always immediately. You know, if you've just been told you're going to be made redundant. I was told I was made, going to be made redundant in 2019. It was a year before I actually was made redundant. But, you know, I was still really upset about it. <laughs> you know, I knew it was coming. You know, my boss was, you know, we'd been talking about it for a long time. And then he said, right, now is the time. And I, yeah, it floods tears. You know, I think he was a bit surprised. He didn't really know what was going on. Um, so... But at some stage, change the narrative, look for the benefit. When I did um, take redundancy, I, I, at first I started saying I was made redundant. And then probably it took me a couple of months before I then turned it round to I was really lucky to have the opportunity to take redundancy and it completely reframed how I looked at myself and yeah, less victim, more, and more in control I had taken. I don't know whether that was actually true. but um, Then you know, opportunity sensing, what have you learnt? from this, great for optimism, and then resilience, what's the next task, I need to take some control, what am I going to do next, I was made redundant, it was 2020, nobody was going out, so I couldn't go and have lunch with all my friends like I was planning to, but I could sort of sit in the garden, enjoy the sunshine, read some books, relax, sort my CV out, things like that, you know, so I did have some actions that I could do, focusing on the next task. So, building optimism, it's not about the coffee was cold and there were no biscuits. It's not, it's not about that sort of stuff. It's about, um, you know, I'm just, I've just lost my job. You know, that's huge. You can't be optimistic from day one. But then you start to look at, okay, what can I do? Um, I went to see... Uh, Simon Sinek and uh, Stephen Bartlett, if anyone knows them, um, yesterday at South Bank. I was really excited. I was like, oh, this is going to be great for my social media presence. I can say everything I've learned. I took a notebook. It was quite disappointing. It was quite disappointing. I learned nothing new. There were no gems. Stephen Bartlett apparently is writing a new book. He didn't even talk about it. Um, so there was nothing. There was no takeaway for, for me. Um, so... I was a bit disappointed, but then this morning I was like, right, but it was great to spend some time with my friend Sam. We did sit at the front of the South Bank and have a very quick beer and a very quick bite to eat. We did chat on the train on the way there, and so actually it was just really nice to spend some time with Sam. And, I, you know, and, I, and I've been there and I've done it and I've, and I've listened to them talk and I've realised actually they're just two people talking, <laughs> maybe. I need to make sure that you guys take, have, do have a takeaway from this. Um, that's what I took away. So think about what you can take away around building optimism. Is there something where you sort of need to flip the narrative and what, what could be the positive from a negative situation? What could you learn? And then what's the next step? So that's the third thing. Hands up. Who has taken at least one, one thing that you can actually change and help develop and grow since you've been sitting here, a few of you. There's some nods and some hands up, thank you. How many have taken two or three? Okay, hands are going down a bit, but yeah. Think about it, think about it. We've talked about adaptability, empathy and optimism. We've talked about emotional intelligence Are there any questions?
think... Oh, no. <laughs> Going back about 20 minutes, do you think, as a society, we're losing our ability to upset people? Well, that is a really good question. <laughs> Not been on Twitter recently. <laughs> <laughs> or thread. Um, I, I think you're right, and actually when I, it, it makes me think of a conversation I had with my friend Sam yesterday on the train to London. Um, her son, uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's a young man in, you know, in, in the world and trying to find his way, and I just said, oh, how's your son? And she said, oh, something happened, and he got really agitated and a bit angry and very upset and quite anxious about something that happened and she was like oh it's so it was so such a shame to see it and I said well maybe it's a good thing because he was getting anxious about I don't know he hadn't he was supposed to be joining a course on how to be you know start a new business so he hadn't gone on it he hadn't had the courage to book it in and then somebody had come and said how did the course go you know he hadn't done it so he was getting very angry with himself and, and I was like well maybe that's a maybe that's a good thing and she just went oh yeah, you're probably right, because he, he then maybe won't want to feel that way again, and that will push him into action. Um, and there is a lot of, uh, because of social media, there's, there's a lot of people just wanting to not dumb things down, but a bit scared about emotions, and, and maybe the straightforwardness in terms of emotional intelligence is, is lacking because we're not seeing each other face-to-face, -face, and being straightforward might be harder when you're online. Um, so yes, I do. I, I think it's, it's emotional intelligence is probably more important now than it ever has been. Um, and we are wanting to keep everybody happy. But you need to go through the, the peaks and troughs of emotions to know that actually emotions are real and they're, you know, you need, you need the downs to recognise the ups. You know, if, if your whole life was just a constant like that, then, you know, we would lose the value of being human. I'm not trying to flip the uh, whole conversation onto the UK educational system, but I think um, it, it's at grassroots where little Johnny or Sally can't lose anymore. They, yes. they, they, they can become runner-up, which I think, I think we believe now, uh, all of us in, in the industries that we're in, we, we do lose. We lose tenders, we lose jobs, we lose all other bits and pieces. So yeah. we're not teaching that at a younger age. That's my opinion on, on, on that. I, I agree, and I don't know whether it is just these days, because when I was at school, which was a long time ago, um, they, uh, it was the same then. It was probably the start of it, maybe. You know, there was no sports day. Well, there was a sports day, but there was no gold medal. There was no winner. There were no, you know, when they were handing out um, awards, you know, you had, you had some... I think, I don't know now, you probably don't even have awards, do you? But they were trying to give everybody an award. Um, well, well done for taking part. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Which is important, and it's important to, to boost people, but there are winners and losers, you know, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation. I found the mapping of it quite interesting. Uh, in specifically, the vase will get broken. That's fatalism. Uh, and you take a helicopter view, and where does optimism sort of link with those three? I, th I would call it realism rather than fatalism. Um, I'd call it realism and y you have to accept that there are some things you can't change. Um, I couldn't change that my mum died when I was 24. I couldn't change the, the violence um, that I experienced. I couldn't change that I was made redundant. But I could change how I perceived it and I could change how I dealt with it. Um, so it's that in, in the face of adversity. Some things will happen you cannot change. But then it's how you deal with it next, how you pick yourself up and what, you, what action you take next. That's important. The other sort of question I had about empathy and everything else, when you look at the entrepreneurs, and I won't mention any names, but they've got satellite systems and all sorts of things, um, are they really empath empathetic with people or are they thrusting and self-motivated? I, I think I know what you think um, by, <laughs> by your question. Um, le good leadership.
comes with, with great emotional intelligence. Not all good leaders have great emotional intelligence. So um, I'd agree with you, some of these... Um, some of these people who purport to be good leaders, you know, have just, you know, maybe not. Maybe, you know, Elon Musk sacked a load of people, you know, on Twitter, you know, all that sort of stuff. He was not a good leader. You know, everyone's gone off and created their own version of Twitter now, haven't they? There's a number of them. Um, not a good leader, just seems to have a load of money, maybe a great investor. I think we're um, probably at our time, um, 10.50. Any more questions? These are the um, bite-sized uh, trainings that, that James was talking about earlier. Um, so feel free to look out for them, um, and I'll be uh, delivering them. Um, yeah, there's a couple next week, and then there's a gap for the summer. So uh, thank you for that. And then please do connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, call me, email me. Check out my website. Don't check it out yet because it's changing, but it'll be much better after the summer but um but yeah yeah lovely thank you very much for inviting me it's been really um lovely to talk to you and take your questions but uh, i'll be here probably till after lunch so i'm um, happy to chat to any of you thank you Um, so they are virtual sessions because they are interactive. They're designed to have you immersed in it and do activities to kind of pull that out. It's online learning school. They can sit and watch something. YouTube's great for that kind of thing. But these sessions are built to be interactive and ultimately to get you talking in, you know, working with your fellow attendees um, just to discuss this through. So it's a massive benefit to having these conversations. I think I'm going to say in person because they are virtual, but with other people, I think it's quite powerful. Anything you want to add to that, just because you're the one facilitating them? Um, sorry. It's all right. It's all right. I shouldn't have moved away. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, you, it, they are interactive. They do make you think. They, you know, you need to come back with questions, and then, um, and also some of the ones are you need to go into breakout rooms and learn from each other and practice. So, for example, on the mentoring program, there'll be a lot of. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some information, I'll give you a tool, and there's some practising, and then some coming back into the room and, and sharing what you've learned. So it is interactive, yeah.